The heart is the center of all teaching in Scripture. Whenever the Bible refers to our heart, it is referring to the center of our being, the fountain out of which everything about us flows. Above all else, here's what you got to guard, your heart. For everything you do flows from it. When we are saved, what happens? We get a new heart. We accept Christ into our heart. He performs a heart transplant, if you will, putting His Spirit in us. This is what happens after you are saved when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. It doesn't matter how degreed or pedigreed you are. You can't change you. We need God to change us. We need God to do a work in us. Some of us can testify, I've already had a heart transplant because I don't even respond to stuff the way I used to respond. I don't think the way I used to think. I don't act the way I used to act. Just keep walking with God and Holy Spirit's going to grab that heart and say, I got to take that out. I got to remove that and I'm going to put in you my word and my will. When you have that heart transplant, you start saying, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Happy Sunday, family, at all of our campuses. God bless you. It is always a joy whenever we have an opportunity to come together and worship. And my goodness, I am super excited for us to jump into this final installment of this amazing walk through the Beatitudes. We have been in this teaching series, The Constitution of the Kingdom, part one. We've been in part one for several weeks as we have been walking through the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, studying the Beatitudes. And so on today, we're going to get into part five, the final installment of our study of the Beatitudes. And y'all, I got to tell you, it's a good one. I'm super excited. Want you to grab your Bible or the TWC app. Want to remind you every single week my teaching notes are out in the app. And I want you to join me in Matthew 5 and we're going to pick up at uh, verse number 9. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 9. You can follow along with us on the screen or in the TWC app. Jesus still on this hill in northern Judea overlooking the Sea of Galilee, says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you." Well, family, this is the final message in our study of the Beatitudes. And these two final Beatitudes by many are considered to be the most significant, but at the same time, the most challenging. These final two Beatitudes, along with the explanations and instructions that follow them, are really meant to be understood together. So, let's jump right in. Now, uh, by way of full disclaimer, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the seventh Beatitude uh, because we don't have a whole bunch of time. But I'm doing it this way because I really want to spend the bulk of our time together this morning examining the eighth and final beatitude. But I'm also preceding this way in this study because in many ways the seventh beatitude sets up the eighth and final beatitude. In the seventh beatitude, Jesus says, blessed or blessed or favored or happy are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. The very first thing that Jesus is teaching to all of us as kingdom citizens is number one, we are called to be peacemakers. We are called, number one, to be peacemakers. You know, just like we discussed in previous Beatitudes that the true measure of us hungering and thirsting for righteousness is in our ability to be merciful, well, what Jesus is also teaching us in this seventh beatitude is that real Jesus people, real citizens of the kingdom of God, children of God, are peacemakers. Now, God is the supreme peacemaker. We know this because this is the culmination of what he was doing when he sent his only son into the world 
to die on a cross. He did all of that to establish peace. Now, if you recall the teaching series we did uh, earlier in the year through the book of Ephesians, if you recall that teaching series, then you probably remember I went really hard in the paint on this truth because the Apostle Paul really focuses on this in the book of Ephesians. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Watch this. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, setting aside in his flesh the law and its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. There it is again. And in one body reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace. There it is again to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, what Paul is saying is that the way that God fixed the animosity and the hatred and the vitriol between the two groups that existed at the time, talking about those that were insiders, Jewish believers, and those who were outsiders, everybody else in the world, is Jesus Christ. Paul says that Jesus did three things. Number one, he is our peace. He made peace in him going to the cross and giving up his life for us. But then he also preached peace. That was the whole essence of his message. And Paul continues this in 2 Corinthians 5 and 19 when he says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Watch this. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So not only did Jesus come to establish peace, He is our peace. He made peace in his work on the cross and he preached peace. But Paul says that God has now given us this ongoing responsibility of peacemaking, of reconciliation. God has given that to us. So as believers, those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God is in essence saying, all right, I sent my only son into the world to make peace. Now, I want you to be ambassadors, kingdom kids, peacemakers, who then go and continue the work of my son. And so a peacemaker, children of God, don't take sides. As a peacemaker, we're not called to take sides. Why? Because we understand that God loves the people on every side of the issue. You have to do something with John 3, 16, when it says, for God so loved the world. Listen to me. There is no category or classification or clicks in that verse. It says, for God so loved the world. That means everybody. That means that as peacemakers, as kingdom kids, as children of God, we understand in our assignment as peacemakers that we're not supposed to take sides. Why? Because God loves everybody on both sides or on every side of these issues. You know, one of the biggest issues with believers today is that we have been lied to and led to believe that we need to take sides. You've got different groups and different cliques saying, are you with us? Are you with them? But, but the truth of the matter is you need to understand this. Those individuals who are pushing that agenda of, you know, if you're a believer, you should be over here or you should be for us. The people that are pushing that agenda, they are not living to please God. They are living and serving the idol of power and self. Yeah, that's good. I need to say that again. They're not living to please God. They are living and serving the idol of power and self. So for an example, if I were to ask you, How many teams are on a football field in a game or on the basketball court during a basketball game? Most of you would say, well, there are two teams, but that's actually not true. See, the lie of the world is that there are two teams on the field and that we have to pick one. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That is not true. 
The truth is, in any football game, in any basketball game, the truth is there are actually three teams on the field. The home team, the away team, and the officiating team, the refs. See, what Jesus is teaching us is that as peacemakers, as kingdom citizens, children of God, we are the officiating team. We are called to bring both teams together and hold them accountable to the rules of the game. So here's the thing about the officials and the refs. They don't make up the rules. They have a rule book that is created by the league. And guess what? We have a rule book that's been created by the creator. The rule book is the word of God. And this is what we have to pledge our allegiance to. This is what has to be the standard for our decision making and the life we live and, and even how we come down on critical issues. I want to show you something in the book of Joshua. It says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. Don't miss that. Joshua says, who are you for? You for us or are you for our enemies? The reply is neither. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? So this is a theophany. This is an Old Testament manifestation of God. And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Oh, I hope y'all don't miss this. Joshua runs up to this theophany, this Old Testament manifestation of God. And Joshua says, Yo, who, who, who are you for? Are you for us or are you for your enemies? And the man responds and says, neither. You got to understand that. This notion of, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Are you pro-life or pro-choice? Are you red or blue? Are you for the rich or the poor? Are you for us or are you for them? The answer for the peacemaker, the answer for the kingdom citizen should be neither. Because we understand that we are called as peacemakers to not take sides, but to make sure that all individuals connect with Jesus, look to him, look to this rule book and understand how to live out and understand how we are supposed to interact and to make decisions on all of the difficult issues that we face in this world. And now this brings us to this final beatitude. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. Hmm. Jesus says this last because he wants us to understand that if we are going to follow him and live out these principles of the kingdom, especially being a peacemaker, we will be persecuted. Here's the second and final point that I want you to understand as we get to this last beatitude. Number two, peacemakers, Jesus people, children of God are persecuted. Yep, you heard me right. Peacemakers. Jesus people, children of God, are persecuted. Now, it's significant to note that in verse 10, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And then in verse 11, he turns around and says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. Now, remember, in addition to his disciples, there's this large crowd that's gathered to hear him teach this Sermon on the Mount. So at first, he speaks to the large crowd and says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And then he turns directly to the disciples and says, now blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. He is telling the entire crowd 
and especially the disciples, you will be persecuted. Now, that word persecuted in the Greek has a few meanings that I'm going to unpack for you in just a moment. The first meaning is to oppress, to violate with violence, to do harm to verbally and physically. The first meaning of this, this word persecute means to oppress, to violate with violence, to do harm to, and that may be verbal harm or it, it may be physical harm. So in light of this statement and in light of this truth, it is super important that we really understand what Jesus is saying here. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't say you will be persecuted because of your own stuff or because you are a trailblazer or because you take the stand for an underdog. Now, oftentimes we attribute the hate that we receive to stuff like that. We say things like, oh, they're just, they're just hating because they're jealous or they don't like you or they're just hating because you're making waves and doing things that have never been done before. Now, without a doubt, because of the pettiness and insecurity of some people, you will experience some opposition and hate for those reasons. But it's important to understand that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, watch this, because of me. What he means by righteousness here is Christ likeness. This is why in the very next verse, verse 11, he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted because of me. Jesus is saying that you will be persecuted because of your commitment to me, because your life is Christ-like, because your behavior imitates the Savior. Because of all of that, you will be persecuted. Now, the second meaning of this Greek word for persecute is actually connected to the Greek word from which we get the English word prosecute. It means to charge you, to accuse you, or to prosecute you because of your beliefs. And so Jesus is saying to them, y'all at the very beginning of his ministry, this is going to happen. Please understand, Jesus hadn't started doing a ton of miracles yet. He has not raised Lazarus from the grave yet. This is the start of his ministry. And he is literally saying to his disciples, y'all need to get ready because if you really adopt this Jesus lifestyle, they, they are going to prosecute you. They are going to persecute you because of your beliefs. And here's the truth. You can't outgrow this persecution. This is not the kind of persecution that, that happens a lot when you're young in the faith. And then the more you mature and the more anointing that's on your life, it goes away. No, you can't outgrow this. Jesus is saying it is what it is. This is Par for the course, if you live this Jesus lifestyle. You know, the great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was actually killed because he stood up to Hitler and spoke out against him, he said something that bears being uh, noted when you study this beatitude. He said, suffering is the cost of discipleship. Get that. Suffering is the cost of of discipleship. Several years ago, when our ministry was in its early years, I had an opportunity to sit down with a man who I deeply admired early on in my, in my ministry career. I never forget, I had an opportunity to go over to Atlanta and meet with him. And, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store, the opportunity to meet your hero. And I remember we, we met um, at the Four Seasons in Atlanta for breakfast and I was so excited thinking that this man was going to give me deep insights for ministry and maybe even a prophetic word for the days ahead and I remember he sat down and I was all nervous to meet with him and he said to me he said I see God all over you he said oh God's gonna use you in a great way but then this is where he lost me because then he said but oh how you are going to suffer I said, what? Excuse me? He said, oh, how you are going to suffer. Now I'm thinking to myself, what kind of whack? Like mentorship is this? 
I'm thinking, this is not what I want to hear. And he just kept emphasizing it. I see God all over you, but oh, how you are going to suffer. I was like, this is crazy. And I got back in my car and was driving home and my wife was like, how was it? I was like, I don't know what to tell you. This is weird. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. He was trying to tell me that, that if you're really going to commit to this Jesus lifestyle, he was literally trying to teach me this beatitude, that you are going to be persecuted. That's what he was trying to tell me. And I didn't understand it then. I, I thought he had bumped his head. I thought it was the wackest advice anybody could ever give me. But I recognize it for the wisdom that it really was and still is. See, when you look at biblical history, what you see over and over and over again are people who were the example for us. I'm talking about people who lived for God and honored God, but you see them being persecuted. Think about it. Abel honored God with his sacrifice, and he was persecuted by his brother Cain. Moses was faithful in doing the will of God and was persecuted over and over and over again. David was God's anointed. He was a man after God's own heart. But even he was persecuted by Saul. Elijah had a kill order put out on him. Jeremiah was thrown in prison. And Daniel was put in a lion's den simply because he prayed to God multiple times a day. These are some of the most outstanding and righteous men of the Old Testament. And every one of them were persecuted. They were persecuted not because they did anything wrong. They, in fact, were persecuted because they honored God and they lived for God. They were persecuted because they were righteous. And I can show you the exact same thing through the life of different individuals, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. See, what Jesus is, is telling them through this beatitude and telling us through his word is if you really commit to this kingdom lifestyle, if, if, you, if you really commit to living a life that is Christ-like, listen to me, it will cost you something. You need to understand, I may not get any amens right here, but the truth is there are some positions you won't get. There are some rooms you won't be invited in. There are some people who won't receive you, some relationships that will not work out, not because there's something wrong with you, not because you were not gifted enough and smart enough and anointed enough, but because you look too much like Jesus, because you have committed to live your life for him. Now, I know some of you are like, what in the world? Let me explain this to you. The reason why this is the case, please don't miss this. The reason why you and I will be persecuted is because the righteous, those who are Christ-like, listen to me, are persecuted because they are different. This is so important. I have to say it again. The reason why the righteous, those who are Christ-like, are persecuted is because they are different. This is why the Pharisees and the teachers of the law hated Jesus. It wasn't simply because he did things that they didn't like. It was because he was different. The way he lived, the way he handled people, the posture of his heart, everything about him was different from them. And, and it was extremely different from the culture that they lived in. So please hear me. In his difference, they were made aware of their deficiencies. See, the big issue with Jesus being different is that his difference forced them to acknowledge their deficiencies. What do you mean, Bishop? Jesus having compassion on people forced them to recognize that they were condemning people. Jesus forgiving people forced them to acknowledge that they were judging people. Jesus loving people forced them to recognize that they were hating people. Everything about Jesus being different forced them to look at their deficiencies. Right after Jesus finishes teaching the Beatitudes, the next thing he begins to teach in the Sermon on the Mount is that we are called to be salt and light. But here's the thing, light exposes darkness. This is why darkness always hates the light. The only way for darkness to be comfortable, the only way for darkness to be darkness 
is to put out light. You know, personally, I used to complain to God when I found myself uh, being left out and talked about and persecuted. I used to complain and say, God, this doesn't make any sense. I didn't do anything to them. I didn't say anything to them. Why? Why are they persecuting me? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you had have had those same kind of conversations with God. But listen to me. It has nothing to do with anything you said or didn't say anything you did or didn't do. It has everything to do with who you are. The Jesus in you shines light and darkness cannot remain in that light. The persecution, the hate, the ostracism and the oppression is because they want to put the light out. That is the only way that they can be comfortable. This is why right before Jesus' crucifixion, when Pilate gathered the chief priest and the rulers and the people, if you remember, particularly in Luke's gospel, Pilate says, y'all, I found nothing wrong with Jesus. There is no basis for your charges against him. What do you want me to do? And they respond and say, release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Now, get this. Y'all, Barabbas was a murderer, but they would rather have a murderer instead of Jesus? Why? Because darkness hates light. The only way that darkness can be comfortable is it has to be around more darkness. That's why they said, give us Barabbas. That's why you've been persecuted. That's why you've been marginalized. That's why you've been maligned. That's why there's some places you can't go. That's why there's some people that will not receive you. Because the only way for darkness to be comfortable is it has to be around more darkness. You, you coming in the office, brightening up the place and people like, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want that. You coming in a relationship talking about Jesus. People like, oh, no, 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 we don't want that. Some of you are like, wait a minute, is this true? Absolutely. Let's check the record on this. The Bible is very clear that persecution is proof of several things. It's proof, number one, of godliness, of godliness. Yes, persecution is proof of godliness. Second Timothy 3 and 12 says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a mic drop moment right there. Persecution is also proof of goodness, of goodness. Yes, yes, it's also proof of goodness. First Peter 2 and 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Yeah, persecution is evidence of goodness. Here's another thing. Persecution is actually evidence of God's glory on your life. First Peter 4 and 14 says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. Yes. If you are persecuted, it is a sign of the glory of God resting on your life. Uh, we're not going to shout on that one, but it's the truth. So let me say this to you. If you have not endured any of this kind of persecution, if, if you're like, oh, well, my life has been easy and I've never had anything difficult or hard to deal with. The question is, are you really Christ like you might need to go back and check the record on it, make sure you are saved and that you are living a life that represents Christ. Because the Bible is clear that when you commit to be Christ like persecution is coming, it's a sign of godliness. It's a sign of goodness. It's a sign of God's glory on your life. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are listening to me and you're like, oh, oh okay, okay, okay. All right, Bishop, I, I hear you. I understand that I will be persecuted. I understand why. But what about any of this? It makes me happy or blessed or favored by God. You remember in all all of this series, we've been talking about that word blessed is makarios in the Greek, and it means happy or favored by God or approved by God. And some of you are like, what about any of this stuff? Makes me blessed, happy, favored, or approved by God. Let me show it to you. Jesus says, blessed or happy or 
favored or approved by God are those who are persecuted. Why? Because in the midst of the persecution, you have some place to turn. Oh, this is so good. God, I love your word. Jesus says, that's why you're blessed. That's why you're favored. That's why you, you should be happy because even though you will be persecuted, you have some place to turn. See what the enemy and the world want to do is persecute you to the point that you break and you ultimately relinquish your commitment to Christ. That's, that's the strategy of the world. The strategy of the world and the enemy is to so persecute you and so pressure you until you give up and stop shining the light of Jesus. They, they want to persecute you until you give in and start going with the flow like everybody else and doing what everybody else is doing. That's what the enemy's after. That's what the world wants. The world wants to put your light out. The last meaning of the word persecute is to follow, to pursue, like a dog chasing you. I remember when I used to walk home from school when I was growing up in Atlanta, and I used to walk by this house, and man, there was this Rottweiler, I mean, the biggest, meanest dog I'd ever seen in my life, and uh, he was on a chain, but there were a couple of times he, he broke from that chain, and I ran like my life depended on it, because I did not want that dog to get me. That's what the, this word persecute, the final meaning of this word, that's what it is. It's to follow, it's to pursue like a dog chasing you. See, what the enemy tries to do is chase you down, to go after you day in and day out until you give up and give in. But thanks be to God. This is why you are blessed. This is why you are favored. This is why you should be happy and approved of by God. Some of you are like, I, I don't get it yet. Let me tell you why. See, let me tell you why you ought to be happy and favored and why Jesus says you're blessed when you're in this place. Because what the enemy doesn't realize is that while he's chasing you, you are not just running from him. You are running to God. God, I love your word. That's so good. I got to say it again. You're not just running from the enemy, you are running to God. You remember Psalm 46 and 1? It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Do you remember Proverbs 18 and 10? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. This is why Jesus says, happy are they, blessed are they, favored are they, even when you're persecuted. Because the enemy thinks that I'm going to chase them down and they're going to give up. But he doesn't realize we ain't just running from him. We're running to our heavenly father. We're, we're running to that place of refuge, that place of strength. No matter how weak I get, no matter how tired I get, no matter how frustrated I get, when I run to God, I get strength. I get safety. I get provision. Oh my goodness. This is why we are blessed when we are persecuted. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This is why in the very next verse, he says, so just rejoice. Oh, y'all missed it. He says, rejoice and be glad. Look at somebody around you and, and tell them that needs to be our response. Tell them we ought to rejoice. Go ahead, go ahead, tell them. And if they didn't receive it, look at somebody else around you and tell them we have something that we need to do. Our response shouldn't be that we mope and moan and complain about the persecution. We are called to rejoice. Mm. I don't know if y'all ready for this. My goodness, I feel like shouting right now. Let me show it to you in the scriptures. I want you to meet me in the book of Acts. And I want you to see something. In, in Acts around chapter 5, it says, Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Once again, this is the persecution of the disciples. Why? Because they're different. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Drop down a couple of verses and watch this. It says, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. This is the persecution. Then they ordered them not to speak 
in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. You see it? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace from, for the name of Jesus. So Jesus tells us to rejoice. He says, you're going to be persecuted, but rejoice. And then you see in Acts 5, this is exactly what the disciples do. They are persecuted, but they don't mope. They don't moan. They don't complain. They don't adopt a, what was me kind of attitude? Why is this happening? No, they said, no, 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 no. He taught us about this. And they told, he told us that we ought to rejoice. That is exactly what they did. Let me show you another place in Acts. Oh my goodness. God, I love your word. Watch this. It says they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. Here we go. Persecution. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When they received these orders, he put them into the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Here we go. About midnight. Thank you, Lord. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening in. Let me stop here. Got to make sure you're tracking with me. So, you see the persecution. They're persecuted because they're different. They're talking about Jesus. They're shining the light. And so Paul and Silas, they are put in prison. They are put in prison, and they are around other prisoners. I love it. The Bible says about midnight. It, it wasn't midnight, but it was close to midnight. I love it because we know weeping may endure for a night, but joy, that's it, comes in the morning. And so about midnight, notice what Paul and Silas are doing. They, they have been persecuted, but what does Jesus teach them and us to do? To rejoice. And so right about midnight, they are singing praise to God. They are having a praise party in the cell. Now, here's the thing I need you to see. It is Paul and Silas in prison. They are persecuted, but they're giving God praise. And there are other prisoners that are in the prison that are not giving God praise, but they are listening in. I love it. I love it. I love it. Some of you are saying, why is that important? Because you remember the word says that all God needs is a couple of people where two or three are gathered together in his name, he promises, I'm going to be there in the midst. So I need you to look around your row, look up and down your row and see if you can find one or two people that don't mind giving God praise, even though they may be going through a season of problems and persecution. You don't need everybody on your row to give God praise. You just really need one or two people. If you gonna be one, all you need is another person or maybe another couple of people because it's significant. Paul and Silas were giving God praise in prison. And pick me up in verse 26. It says, suddenly, Oh, God, I love your word. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, at once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains come loose. Don't miss that. Oh, you just missed it. Don't, 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 don't miss that. It was only Paul and Silas that were praising. But because... God promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, even in the midst of persecution, if you will give me praise, if you will rejoice, Jesus is saying there's power in your praise. And so those two people were the only two people in the prison giving God praise, rejoicing in the midst of persecution. But the result of their praise was that everybody's chains came off. I wish I could preach to somebody up in here this morning who doesn't mind finding a praise partner that may be further down but somewhere on their road. Don't worry about the person on your road that doesn't want to give God praise because they're still going to benefit from your praise. 
Because if you can hook up with one or two people that don't mind even going through persecution and problems and pain, giving God praise, your praise is so powerful that everybody connected to you is going to benefit. God, I love your word. I wonder if there could be two or three people on your row that will give God a radical praise right now. I may be going through problems, but I'm going to praise. I may be going through difficulty, but I'm going to praise. I may be even in a season of persecution and being misunderstood and misrepresented, but I have chosen to give him praise because your praise is powerful. Hallelujah. Give him praise this morning because he deserves it. Yes. Give him praise. Jesus says, when you are persecuted, he says, don't, don't fold up. Don't raise the white flag of surrender. Don't think you've done something wrong. He says, when you're persecuted, rejoice. He says, because you're blessed. You're happy. You're favored. You are approved by God because there is power in your praise. Oh, God, I feel the power of God right now. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your word. I don't, I don't know who this is for, but it's blessing me. You hear me? I can run around right now and, and just lay in the floor because this is my word, but I don't think that I'm the only one who needed this word. I know that there's somebody right now that needs to give God a radical praise because you got the answer. It's not you, boo. It's that you're different. You are a light bearer. And so you don't need to stick your lip out. You don't need to feel like you are missing anything. You just need to learn how to give God praise right where you are and watch God move in some significant ways. Oh, family. Listen, I don't mind you taking a praise break right up and through here. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Mm, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Ah, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this truth that is so needed in our life. I thank you, Lord, that we resolve, like Paul and Silas, to give you praise, to rejoice in the midst of persecution. Father, I pray that you would continue to use this word to give us clarity, strength, and so much more. Father, I thank you for individuals right now who are receiving this word and whose hearts are being changed as a result. I thank you for the praise that is in the atmosphere. I thank you for the praise that's on our lips and in our hearts because we understand how blessed we are when we're persecuted. Now, Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice who needs to make a decision to receive you as Christ, to trust you with their whole life, there may be other decisions that need to be made, Lord, but for every decision to get connected to this church home, um, to take their next steps and to grow. Father, for every decision, I give you praise and honor and glory for it now. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And those who agree, shout amen. Come on, give them a radical, radical, radical praise.